So I also invite you to check out if you're interested in that space. There are now a lot of communities talking about refi, tokenization of carbon. Ecota, I think, it's a good source of knowledge and networking. There's a lot of webinars that have been organized recently. Um, for example, carbon as a new asset class. How do we understand this asset class on chain? Uh, the emerging VC landscape in carbon market. You know, if you want to raise funds in that space, who do you go talk to and how does it work for startups? And there will be more events, so please stay tuned. Um, but maybe to make sure that everybody had uh, the same level of understanding, we just wanted to go back to some basics on carbon credits and what does it mean to introduce Web3 in that space. And for that, Alison, <laughs> maybe you can share a few words. My name is Allison. As Lucas said, I'm from Climate Collective and happy to talk to you a bit more about that later. Um, but just to take a step back and, and ground us in some context of this conversation, it looked like there was some familiarity with carbon credits, but who is on the same page, what, what is a carbon credit? Um, ultimately, it's a way to channel more capital into projects and technologies and approaches on the ground that are removing or sequestering carbon from the atmosphere. So it has a really important role to play in achieving net zero globally. Um, and there are a couple of different frameworks that this can be managed through. It can be managed through what we call compliance markets that are regulated by government programs like a, uh, a state-run cap-and-trade program, for example, like California has or Washington. Um, or there is a voluntary market, uh, which mostly corporates and individuals and companies uh, choose, they opt into. They're not legally mandated to participate in it, but they, they want to uh, make progress and show their, their stakeholders and their consumers that they are uh, climate conscious and involved to offset their emissions. Now, in this landscape of, of and life cycle of generating a carbon credit, um, there are a lot of different steps. I like this graphic a lot because it shows you um, kind of the key steps in, in generating a credit. How does it come to life? Um, first, you need to design the project. Once that's implemented, you need to measure how much carbon has been sequestered, report on that, and also verify it through, through several different means. And finally, when you want to sell that into the market, who's the buyer, who's the seller, how does that transaction take place? If you look a little bit farther down, there are a lot of different steps and a lot of different um, uh, links in this value chain, uh, which make it quite complex, especially in the voluntary market, um, because there is no unified set of regulation or rules or standards on what quality means, although there are a lot of actors out there working to address this right now, and we are making progress. There's no one rule sheet that says, this is what good quality looks like, this is who issues it, this is how it should be retired, this is how much it should be sold for. So there's a ton of variation in the market right now. Um, so in order, to, in order to, to get more buyers and more participants in the market, both generating credits and selling them, we need to create more elements of standardization so that buyers know what they're looking at. And so when you purchase a credit, you know, okay, this is great quality, this is how much data we have on it, or this is a bit newer technology. I'm willing to take that at risk because I want to see it evolve. But right now, there are a lot of challenges <laughs> in this market, in project design and financing in particular. Getting money just for a product to be implemented in the first place can, can be very tricky. Um, in MRV, there are a lot of analog procedures. There's a lot of like, literally like paper and pencil, Excel, PDFs that are not machine readable. Um, consultants being flown to project sites to verify uh, elements of human error that can be introduced there. There's, there's again, a lot of lack of standardization. Um, in methodology development, every different type of project that you develop, whether it's improved cook stoves or direct air capture or enhanced rock weathering or planting mangroves, these are all very different types of projects, right? And so making sure that they're all up to par on the latest science, it's hard to get people involved on a voluntary basis to, to volunteer their time and expertise to say, yes, this is the best and latest science available to implement a project. Um, and then even to issue a credit, there are huge bottlenecks with registries, the, the bodies that, that issue and track how, how credits are, um, are issued to their brand name effectively and then sold, and then retired. Um, double counting or double claiming, which are two different things that you may have heard of, um, 
making sure that uh, once a, 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 a credit is taken out of circulation that it can't be claimed again um, is, is an issue that people are trying to tackle. And then transactions. How do we facilitate more liquidity? How do we make sure that, um, that what we're funding is actually going towards good quality projects on the ground? Um, so a lot of the folks that you'll hear from tonight are, are approaching this market from different angles and approaching different challenges um, and in different problems in there and they have really innovative solutions to address that. But that's kind of the, the overlay of Carbon Credits 101. Um, and here is a very overwhelming snapshot of <laughs> some of the players in the space. And this is just to give you an idea of the universe that we're operating in, okay? So on the buy side, on the left here, you have a lot of corporates, you have governments and NGOs, um, different brokerage platforms. In the middle, in the sales, you'll see this, this cacophony, this like chaos of actors here. There are so many different ways to buy and sell a credit. Um, it can be quite confusing. And on the supply side, there are a number of different ways to generate them as well. But this is just to give you an overlay of what is out there. Um, within this mass universe, you'll see uh, blockchain applications and tokenization are one small subset of that. And that's what we're going to focus on today, is just on this little neighborhood right here. And as it relates to the work with Ecota and what we've been um, working on and what Lucas will talk to you more about in just a second is we've tried to really dive deep into that neighborhood of tokenized applications um, for credits and explore who's doing what, can we map out some trends, what does this mean for policy. Um, so here's just a kind of a, a brief snapshot of some of the mapping that we've done. We've looked at different groups um, and, and all the different brands that are out there on financing. Um, so channeling money into projects, um, that digital MRV, measurement, reporting, and verification, people who do the tokenization infrastructure, um, bringing those credits into the digital realm, trading, so marketplace platforms, um, and then different product integrations. How do we build um, credit sales into different elements of life? So not just going to one place to purchase credits on a platform, but how do you build it into e-commerce e or automated like uh, payment offsets. So we have a lot of exciting groups to talk to you about what they're doing in this realm today. Back Thank to you. you. Yeah. yeah, so that's a work in progress in a sense what we wanted to share between Ecota and Positive Blockchain. We are invited, we're inviting all of you, especially if you're busy working on projects, Sydney could just made it, we'll be excited about <laughs> some of the talks later. Uh, but if you're working in the space, you know, help us, come, fill out the form, bring more data, um, join the working groups. Um, it's a lot of uh, learnings as well, and for you it's a great opportunity to, you know, take part and network in the ecosystem. So, very shortly, uh, there are a few slides about what we have seen so far. Uh, there's much more that will come in the coming weeks and months. We have 173 entries in that database. So these are all projects or startups involved somewhere in the tokenization uh, value chain. Right? They may be in the financing, in the MRV, or in the offsetting and retirement. <coughs> Top countries, as you can see, uh, and again, this is from the database. There are some data that, we, that are still missing or that's still being qualified. But from the data we have, top country is the UK. That's maybe why Alison, you're based in the UK. Uh, we have Germany, 17. And uh, we have a list of uh, beautiful projects here. Singapore, United States, USA. Some projects don't really identify with a specific headquarter. They're fully distributed. That's why it's represented here. How many in total in the database? So 173. In total in PB? No, no, this is only for the ECOTA database, so only the ones involved in the Carbon Web3 space. At Positive Blockchain, we have about 1,400 projects uh, listed, and so the idea is to keep monitoring that subset together with Ecota. Uh, obviously, it's something quite recent, so in 2017, you had maybe five, six startups identified working in that space. And it's been growing steadily with a big boom in 2021, 2022. I think it's a time where we saw maturation of a lot of technologies like oracles. People started to talk about DAOs, 
they realized it was really easy to come up and you know have your full tokenization package and take an asset and bring it on chain. So I think it really helped um, <coughs> accelerate the growth in the in the market. Thirty different identified blockchain platforms used by the different projects. Obviously, right Ethereum, Polygon, but also Silo uh, are the main ones. Solana, Cardano, and many others. We will keep monitoring as well which platforms as layer one and layer two are used and how are the projects using these platforms exactly. 35 identified projects which already launched their token and their own token which usually represents that CO2 asset. It also shows that we're not only talking about you know, a few projects in, uh, in their backyard uh, thinking about some big plans. There's a lot of things that is already live and where you can already participate. 25, 25 identified marketplaces. I mean, as you know, right, digital assets and tokens are being exchanged exchange in many marketplaces nowadays, whether they are centralized or decentralized marketplaces. Uh, <clears throat> that's why some of the projects, they are also on Uniswap or Bittrex or the more classical crypto exchange. And some of them are more targeted the, the specialized marketplaces, and we have some here, like Senken, uh, Region, um, and some others. And some projects, they just try to do everything and they build their own marketplace as well. Yeah, and so some of the other data points that we hope uh, to be collecting and, uh, and, and also that we hope to share more about in the future is also about the token volume, the project types that we see mainly being tokenized. Is it more nature-based project? Is it more technology-based project? Which methodology do they use? Uh, we'll hear maybe today talk a bit about tokenizing existing credit versus tokenizing you know, digital native tokens, which is something different. So what is the trend in the space around that? Um, ecosystem integration. Um, I think we don't want to see fragmentation happening again in that space with every token and every project doing something different and maybe we'll have some talks about that tonight. Token standard, talk a lot about fungibility, semi-fungibility, NFT, this means completely different thing when you want to establish a financial market. And finally regulatory status, which is quite interesting because when we ask a lot of projects, well, they leave it blank <laughs> because they don't know. Oh, or maybe they don't want to share it, I don't know. <laughs> but that's definitely something we want to study a bit more. And voila, I hope uh, at least it you know, gives you an impression of the ecosystem. Again, stay tuned, we'll release a little bit more. Now we'll go through uh, talks. Uh, we'll have then about 10 to 15 minutes break. And then we'll come back for a fishbowl uh, where the concept will be basically that we are we're having a discussion all together and you'll be free to ask all the questions you have. After each of the talk, we are still uh, taking maybe two or three questions. We really, there are a few talks, so we don't want to extend it too long, but if you have one burning or two burning questions, we take them and then we move to the next talk. All good? Okay. you have any question at that point or something that was said that you didn't understand? Oh, good. All right. And so we have a few speakers, and the first one, oh, I forgot almost the most important action, I think, is the form. We have a form with Ecota where you as a project owner, you know, can simply fill out your information. I think Nick already did, right? So thank you for that. How was the experience? Uh, it was great. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah, uh, we'll also circulate and announce that uh, publicly in coming days and weeks. If you want to go have a drink, just go um, at the back. And uh, thank you so much for Silo to host us in this office at Factory and uh, support the whole organization as well. Speak louder. Oh yeah. So we can capture this. Up. I do speak loud, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's for every speaker. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> we'll do it. Yeah. So please, all the speakers, speak loudly and say hi to the camera. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs>
Me again. Hi. Miss you all. Um, <laughs> is this loud enough? Is that good? All right, just give me the sign if it needs to be louder, okay? Um, so, I'm from uh, Climate Collective. My name is Allison again. We are an innovation network that supports digital, digital innovation um, to unlock climate action at scale. Um, we specifically have focused on blockchain innovations from our start. We originally evolved out of the Celo ecosystem, so we do have a very close relationship with them, but we look to support and help to build um, tech that is interoperable um, because we see the, the future as multi-chain and we want to help uh, drive as much adoption and, and use as possible. So um, a little bit about how we operate, how are we unlocking innovation for climate action at scale. We have kind of a three-tiered approach. Um, we want to first help builders to innovate more. Ooh, sounds like we have a little echo. Um, uh, so, some of the ways that we do that, we have a membership association. We have about 35 members right now. Some of them are in this room. We have Senkin, Atem, and others. Um, Sala Foundation is one. Um, and we want to help uh, resource those builders with, um, with network connections, um, sometimes with funding. Um, we want to help harness the collective intelligence of the group to overcome challenges together. At this point in the market, we have a lot more to gain by working together than being in direct competition. So that's what we try to foster, is more collaboration and innovation um, through, through that network effect. Um, we also want to help innovate new, new sources of knowledge for how blockchain can be applied um, for climate action. So to that end, we fund um, pilots of new use cases. We want to help tinker and, and innovate and explore how can this tech really make a step change as far as climate action goes. Once we uh, help to support that innovation, we then want to document it. We want to, we want to store those messages, spread them with the world through white papers, through working groups, through webinars um, and conferences. We want to help build awareness in this space and in doing so, build more trust in this space. Um, can we help educate corporates and institutions on how this tech can be applied? Can we help bring more buyers and liquidity into this market? So the third step then is once we have applications that are, that are proven on the ground, and have built a bit of trust um, with buyers or different folks in the market, can we help scale the adoption of this tech through institutional partnerships? Can we, um, can we help to drive uh, new adoption and, and new use cases by scaling it out into the world? So that's kind of our theory of change. That's how we operate. Um, oops. There we go. There is a snapshot of most of our members. Um, so yeah, we, in, in terms of the, the different categories across the Web3 and climate ecosystem, we range from groups who are doing financing, like Solid World DAO, um, groups who are doing tokenization infrastructure, like Toucan and Flow Carbon and Regen Network, um, and Reseed as well. We work with marketplaces, um, like Thalo and Senken, um, and we also work with different types of environmental assets, not just carbon. So groups like Renewum that do renewable energy credits, um, or uh, let's see, Collectivo, which is working with uh, groups in Curacao to develop um, geo NFTs for food forests, all helping to drive more capital into climate work um, on the ground. Um, and a couple of other members who are financiers themselves um, and funders like Mercy Corps Ventures, uh, like Flory Ventures, um, Cello as a purchaser and, and C-Labs as a purchaser of, of uh, carbon assets. So that's kind of a snapshot of where we work. Any questions that I can take right now? Or find me after if you're curious. Yeah, cool. so, yeah maybe just a question. How, how do the network, how is the work network organized? How do people collaborate through the Climate Collective, maybe? Yeah, so that is my job. Um, so, <laughs> Uh, you talk to me. Um, so we have a number of ways that we engage our membership. The first is through recurring uh, community calls that are internal to membership. We want to foster collaboration, address key challenges together, see how we can overcome them, share asks and offers. Um, and then we also host learning calls that are not exclusive to members, so, so open to public as well. And the objective there is really to learn something. Um, builders are so busy with their heads down, you know, going, 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 but the space is, is so dynamic and quickly changing that we want to create an environment where we can pick our heads up, look around and see, you know, what's going on? Can we learn from one another? Um, and can we foster opportunities to work together? So I would say the calls are, are one space um, for our membership as well. We, we facilitate um, a Slack space where they can 
interact directly and coordinate. Um, we have different marketing services to try to raise awareness and, and uh, boost engagement. Um, and then, yeah, through pilots, we, we don't work exclu exclusively with members. We work with, uh, we try to work with new partners, actually, um, whether they are uh, banks or um, UN institutions or um, different nonprofits on the ground who want to experiment and do some R&D with this tech before they, you know, throw all their reputational weight behind it. Can they, if they want to learn about this um, and just kind of dip a toe in, we want to facilitate partnerships through that, through pilot programming. Do you also work with partners for research papers or like position papers? Sorry, do we work with? Uh, also with like external partners because you mentioned that you were also creating content. Is that also one of the things that you do with like external parties or does only your in-house? Yeah, great question. So we, um, we've worked to, well we chaired a, um, a working group for the World Economic Forum recently and a, a, a white paper came out of that. We've also been working with Rocky Mountain Institute on a landscape guide for the voluntary carbon market and soon to be a, a buyer's guide um, as well for the, for the voluntary carbon market. So yes, we work with external partners on content as well. And open to academic partnerships too. Yeah. Do you focus on carbon only or also on biodiversity net gain or other? Fantastic question. Not, not limited to carbon. So many of our um, members work in carbon because I think that's where, that was a, a, a hot spot where a lot of blockchain innovations emerged. There were clearly a lot of challenges that the blockchain technology was well positioned to address and so I think that's one of the primary use cases that emerged in the first years of this market but no we, we work with um, people who are generating data like Syflex DNA works with a very simple water blotting um, technique that's been around for years um, it's not necessarily innovative but they do DNA sequencing um, essentially to create environmental DNA of the species that are in a given area and they track that on chain with tokens. Um, and so through that model, you could foresee, for example, um, every time that data on, on species health is referenced in an academic research paper, for example, could you build in a royalty structure that could go back to communities to reward them for that work? Um, if you tracked it over time and there was a, a net gain in biodiversity, could, could you program in rewards for that as well? Um, who else? Digital Gaia is working on digital MRV in, in a number of different realms as well. Um, one of our newer groups, um, they're called Open Carbon Protocol, but they're looking into biodiversity credits as well. Um, and we're looking to expand yeah, beyond carbon, for sure. Thank you so much. <laughs> and we're now welcoming Atem. Um, yeah, so my name is Alberto, I'm lead in business development uh, at Atem. Atem is the carbon API for efficient and compliant carbon offset. So today, we all know the climate crisis is something we need to solve. Uh, it's our problem uh, and sooner or later we will need to deal with it. Um, looking at it from the carbon perspective, uh, we think carbon will become a core capability of companies, which means it's not just a one-off purchase at the end of the year, they offset the purchase, but they should know how to manage carbon within their day-to-day -day operations. Carbon markets are a great way to deal with it, uh, but they are fragmented. We all know uh, there are a lot of middlemen that uh, use the symmetry to charge crazy prices, and so high prices and little impact, which uh, destroy the confidence in the market and the money flowing through innovation that are needed. In the future, we see climate action at scale uh, with billions of funds going to high impact projects. So, in order for this to happen, the market needs to be aggregated, uh, there needs to be transparency, and this will result in transformation from a market where it's uh, the seller who decides the price to a market where the buyers brings these price signals because they have more power. So the challenge is that there are conflicts of interest, the infrastructure is updated, and we know we need to fix that. Our secret is on-chain carbon, uh, and especially is the integration of carbon in day-to-day -day processes that companies have. How do we do this? We bring many players from the industry or even outside uh, we aggregate the data, and that results in uh, 20 plus million carbon credits inventory. There's no lock-in, everybody can let, lose their own supply, and uh, we also have a demand interface 
that allows companies to easily buy carbon credits. And we are able to integrate with external sources that validate uh, the quality of the credits we are selling. So, to quickly show how it works, uh, and this is just like an MVP of how the API works, uh, so that's not the core product. But yeah, so with our platform, we are able to uh, search carbon credits, filter by type, uh, uh, vintage, uh, location, and so on. You, are easy, you can easily buy, so in a few seconds you can go to the platform, say how much you're willing to pay, uh, the tons you want, and you can go ahead and place the order. Once that's done, you're able to manage your carbon in clicks, so you go and you can return a credit without having to uh, pass through your uh, account on a registry. And then you're able to retire and get this certificate, which can be shared externally, and a transaction hash that shows that this credit was actually burned. So we can go over uh, double, count, double counting. I think this is really important because all the companies we spoke to about on-chain carbon, they were really worried about this traceability and how do we know, since our name is not on the VERA registry, that this credit is not fake. So we think that to scale impact, we need to integrate this in the operation, as I said. And we want to become the corporate operating system for carbon. Why now? Um, there are three main reasons uh, we see for this work now. Uh, SAP and other ERP providers want to integrate carbon into day-to-day -day management. This is required by their clients, and they also see that's where we're going, and it's also a way to profit more for them. So they want to do it. So they look for a solution. And digital carbon is a perfect fit, because it allows to have quick transaction compared to the usual uh, old PDF way that the market is in. Plus, you have players like Severa, Zero, Particula, that can provide extra information to make uh, buyers confident in what they are purchasing, uh, even when it's automated, right? Because when it's automated, you might be like, how do I know that credits I'm buying and they're not handpicked are still reliable? You could, you could use uh, these ratings to have a feedback. So, to give you an idea of what's going to happen, or what we think is going to happen. This is from SAP. They want to have a way to account for carbon on an ingredient base. So you have a final product, and you can break down to the emission from the almonds, the emission to transport the almonds, and so on. And then offset every single part of the product, instead of just accounting for all of it and with at once. Our API would allow to take this data from this transactional carbon accounting, as we call it, and buy and source credits to match those emissions. And then it would feed back to the ERP system uh, the information on your current portfolio and value, and especially give you a list of auditable retirements which you can show when people come to you and they ask you customers or uh, governments or whoever comes and says, okay, you said you offset your yogurt production. Can you show it? Yes, I can show you how you offset every single step with the certificates that make us. So, that's our plan, and um, thank you very much for the time. We have one or two questions. Paul. Can you elaborate a bit on the quality scoring you mentioned at the beginning? So yeah, you... sure. So our view is that we want to aggregate everything that is on market and let participants choose. Uh, at uh, the current moment, we are planning to integrate B0 ratings, and then people will be able to filter based on that. But we are open to integrate more data sources as they come, uh, and also it comes down to a matter of price and what customers would be willing to pay. But that's how we would filter, rather than be ourselves doing the filtering. We are not specialized in scoring credit, so we would rely on third-party data provider. Um, so you also can, um, did I get it in like, what is unique about you is that you basically look at every single step of emissioning from the whatever company, and that is where you document. And this is what this is basically the unique selling point. And you look at the single steps of the processes or whatever yeah. the company is doing. Yeah, sure. So the, the kind of the accounting part, it's not our uh, our, our job basically. So that we receive this data. What is particular is that with our API, you could make a small transaction targeted and automated transaction for each one of these steps. So that's our value proposition. Kind of, you give us a number for how much the almonds pollute, and we can offset that specific amount in an easy and automated way. Okay, I guess there'll be more questions as well during the pitch ball. I think you have a question. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> I, was what, I was wondering what kind of um, uh, what kind of due diligence do you do, if you do any, to the people selling the carbon credits? 
because I guess that's uh, kind of like an important point for big companies. Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, the core in supply, we offer the Vera Chip credits in our own chain, so it's not really like a single person selling the credit. Um, in the future, as we integrate more supply, we're looking to work with uh, high regarded players in the industry uh, at first. And then when we will work with smaller ones, we will for sure have to figure that out too. But as of now, I don't have a good answer. So. Okay. <laughs> what, what's a high regarded player in the industry? <laughs> Yeah, I mean like brokers that are, are well known, I uh, you know ACT commodities or either or like kind of, uh, yeah, kind of, they, they have some backing, but still uh, it's uh, to be defined and also to we're open to yeah. inputs on, on that, this kind of thing, stuff. Like, oh, because I mean, right now you don't even know what to trust anymore, right? So Yeah, exactly. I think it's one of the discussion points because people used to say maybe a year or two ago, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to take the risk fast factor myself, so I trust Vera. Right, and now we are in a space where, who do I trust, right? Because we all see that maybe it's not the Vera anymore, and maybe we leave that for <laughs> later in the night to discuss and brainstorm, but thank you so much. Oh, and the next one is actually me, because next to... <laughs> I don't want to speak uh, uh, So next to my uh, position at Positive Blockchain, I mean my daily job is at uh, Verity Tracking as uh, Lead Europe and in charge of product. Uh, so we are focusing more on the digital MRV and so maybe a, a just a couple of slides where I want to focus on MRV and also the inset. How many of you are familiar with the inset? Not, not, not many. So what's important to keep in mind whenever we talk about climate solutions and emissions for corporate is that the first priority is to reduce emissions, right? It's not to offset. If you look at the pathway of Microsoft to carbon negative by 2030, it needs to be aligned with the Paris Agreement and it will come mainly from reduction of Microsoft of emissions in its own supply chain, own activity and own supply chain. I mean, you need to understand, okay, what is my scope one, two, and three of emissions? So scope one and two in my own activity and scope three in whatever I'm buying. Right? And then whatever else is remaining can still be neutralized by carbon removals or typical offsets. In all the frameworks that are now offered for corporate to follow the same trajectory, like if you're not familiar with the SBTI, I invite you to do that research. In all this framework, you don't allow a company to continue to pollute more and offset more. And then they can still say we're carbon neutral. It's something that happened in the past, and in the future we're moving in a world where we need to reduce and be aligned to the Paris goals, and the rest you could still neutralize. And so what's happening, for example, for transport, is that if you want to decarbonize transport, right, let's say your flight emission, well, maybe you can incentivize sustainable fuels, right, to displace the emission from fossil fuel. And so at Verity, we started to work with companies like Givo that take a circular economy approach in producing sustainable aviation fuel and other types of fuels to decarbonize transport. So they're taking agricultural products and residues and turning them into ethanol and refining it into sustainable aviation fuel. In certain cases, what we call the SAF, the green jet fuel, can cut 50% of emissions. In certain cases, it can be 100%. Right? So if you blend 50% of your kerosene for a flight with a SAF that cuts 100%, then you automatically cut 50% of the flight. And so, so the logic we are enabling with tracking all the data in the value chain of that fuel from the feedstock, so the raw material that comes from the farm until the production, the intermediate transport, the storage, until the plane. But if you track all the emission savings in that value chain, the emission saving is basically the scope three for whoever is buying a ticket on that flight. So if you have a corporate company that has its emission in the scope three, right, having your employees travel around the world, 
Well, then you can bring this data and the CO2 savings from the sustainable fuel as a carbon certificate that you sell to that company. And it's not an offset anymore because this is an emission that's happening in your supply chain. This is where we talk about inset, and in my mind, it's a really powerful and yet to be discovered space. So, yeah, happy to talk more about that and you know, what's happening in the whole DMRV space to make sure we have end to end traceability and that whoever is buying this SAF inset token can, you know, really buy it in trust that. Uh, the fuel is really sustainable and that all the risks have been uh, removed in the supply chain. Um, yeah, I think that was it. Thank you so much and uh, happy to discuss more if you have questions. Any, yeah? Uh, so you're tokenizing uh, green fuel, like a carbon neutral fuel in a way. I'm still not exactly certain about the involvement. Yeah. So one of the things that's happening in this value chain, for example, is to incentivize farmers to switch to regenerative agriculture practices and increase the sequestration of carbon in the soil. You have a lot of programs that do this completely independently from the fuel, right? And if they do it, you generate carbon credits from using the farm soil as a carbon sink and you can sell it as an offset in the voluntary carbon market. This is what's happening today. But we do it differently because this, this benefits that has been captured in the soil, we include it in the product that is created right, from the plant or from the residue that grow on that land. Right, so instead of selling it as an offset, we can sell it as an inset. So the, the airline buying the sustainable fuel that come from that farm is buying the inset, so they are the one directly supporting the transition to regenerative agriculture for the farmer. Is that, I'm still trying to get my head around the inset yeah. thing, but is there like a risk that this increases double counting? Because if you've got you know, the airline saying we're using sustainable aviation fuel, but then you've got say a corporate buyer who's buying credits directly from the fuel producer, yeah. um, how do you like track all of that and make sure yeah. they're not being counted? So it's a good question. In, in the chemical space and sustainability tracking for chemicals, we have the concept of mass balancing. Because if you think about the grain of corn, for example, that gets turned into ethanol and then sap, it's impossible to track physically grains of corn that are all differentiated because they come from different fields. So you track the mass of sustainable and non-sustainable biomass that goes in the process and then the mass that comes out and you must balance it. And it's a great opportunity for blockchain because what you need to do is track the physical product and then create digital twins next to it. And once one certificate has been retired, it cannot be retired by someone else. So we have the same approach that, you know, then in the carbon... Um, like carbon token marketplace, for example. So, right. so if I understand it correctly, the, the sustainable aviation fuel company could not sell their fuel as sustainable if they're also selling the carbon off offsets. On yeah. So if I'm an airline, I can take a fuel naked from sustainable attributes. So it's a kerosene fuel. So 100% emission. I'm not doing any saving. Or I can say, all I also buy you all the sustainable benefit from right. it, and then I buy both together. Now what's happening as well in the market is that sustainable aviation, aviation fuel is not always available in terms of logistics and storage everywhere in the world. So there, there are systems that are being created that are called book and claim, where you can literally have a trip between Australia and New York that will use the inset, so taking the SAP certificate from somewhere in the world, even though there was no SAP in the plane. So there was no sustainable fuel in the plane, but since both are separated, you take the certificate from somewhere else. And that quantity of somewhere else gets naked from its sustainable attributes. It's a little bit complicated, but I can tell you in the marine space, marine shipping, logistics, DHL, masks, um, the SAF, the airlines, it's a huge, huge trend since about like one or two years to go more and more in that space. Can you 
compare it a bit like I'm a, as, a, as a customer of a green energy supplier yeah. and, then, and then the energy that comes out of my socket at home, yeah. it's not the energy that that supplier meant is produced. But Great point. Yeah. A renewable energy certificate, the RECs, is the same thing. You cannot track physically the electrons. But you generate one token for one uh, megawatt yeah. of green electricity and you can sell it somewhere else. The all important is that you be able to track it, know where they come from, have a registry where you see which one has been retired and not double counted. The total matches. Yeah. Last question and then we we'll move. <laughs> I think it was you. Oh, was it? No, I thought I saw somebody else. Uh, can you like... Uh, from what I understand, it's like kind of a recursive way to get your scope 3 emission down your valve value chain. Like, so it's uh, actually like dealing with the scope 1 and scope 2 emissions of, throughout your uh, value chain. But, and so, for instance, can you like uh, generalize it not just for the, uh, uh, the farming, also for, for instance, the transportation of the, the fuel itself, like going to the... Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the, the logistics. Yeah, it's it's part. The transportation is part of the carbon intensity score, which is the carbon footprint we calculate during life cycle assessment for the fuel that comes here. So we know that we know per fuel quantity how much grams of CO2 equivalent is inside, and this this gram we compare it to the baseline, which is the fossil fuel. So if fossil fuel is 90 gram of CO2 per megajoule and your SAF is 45, then you do 50% emissions. Right, that's, that's the basic math. But again, happy to dive more, and there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, it was just uh, awareness raising. And yeah, thank you for your great question, and let's move on. Kasten. All right, thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, my name is Kasten. Uh, I'm CTO in particular. Some of you, or many of you, know me already from the one and a half years in the past um, when I've been with Green Trade. So I've been on the side of tokenization of carbon credits and also operating in the marketplace, working with project developers and also with corporate clients. And um, yeah, I think uh, all of you um, got to know now a lot about the growing landscape. I mean, there are more and more tokens uh, in the market, it's constantly growing, and it's really difficult to actually. Uh, see what is really behind the token, so what's the risk involved in buying into it. So maybe um, we start uh, with a little um, question in the beginning. How many of you did invest into any kind of token so far? Just give a hand side. Okay, a lot. So that was what I expected on this event. That's pretty good. Um, how many of you did invest into real world assets? Uh, okay, a few ones, a few ones, very good. <laughs> That's <a> much. <laughs> and how many of you did invest into ESG assets? Okay, yeah. a little bit less than half. That's pretty good. All right, thank you very much. And how did you experience it? Was it really that transparent, like it's always proclaimed with using blockchain and comparable, liquid? And secure. Did actually anyone of you that care about the security when buying <laughs> a token? Like, can there be an exploit or what's really behind that company? Do I really have that real world asset behind the token? Did you ever thought about it? Or you just invest into it to promote mm. the space? <laughs> ah, not so much. <laughs> okay, no. I don't think so, you know, most people just don't. Um, so, yeah. Also looking at the other side of the buyer's market, um, we see and we talk really to over 100 token um, issuers and there's a big problem with the actual demand. So it's most people or most companies, they really struggle to actually find buyers or find clients. And um, the problem is that on the buyer side, there's not enough trust and transparency. So they're not really able to look behind the token. That's why they don't purchase it. And like you did here this evening, um, the whole carbon market is already yeah, a little bit difficult, it became a little bit more difficult in the past months. And now when you think about the carbon market and blockchain in addition, there are so many risks involved. And, you know, that's a big struggle and you can see here based on these numbers, um, that's a very common problem. So it's not isolated for some of the companies, it's really for the whole market. We are all struggling with the email. And, yeah, the question is, 
how can we get more trust and confidence from investors and buyers to invest into it? You know, the goal is to drive more capital into the whole climate sector. And what's the solution for this? Actually, an independent rating. So with particular, we really look behind what's behind the token. So what's, what's behind the company? How is the token connected to the real world asset? It's not only about the project, the carbon project, so, because we're not only talking about CO2, it's about the whole ESG space, so also biodiversity, water, uh, renewable energy, but also the whole space about assets or real world assets. This can be also like a share um, of a real estate, a share of a company, um, whatever. So just think about your imagination, I think it's unlimited. And we believe, um, that was providing this kind of in-depth report, and I call it you know, like token intelligence, we can really create more confidence on the buyer side, and when we talk to banks and asset managers, we see that they actually really want to invest some money into it, but they care about, for example, the security, how is the smart contract designed and audited, but also like how is the economic perspective, is there actually a secondary market, is it a liquid market? Uh, maybe uh, we've seen uh, several examples this evening, like multi-chain, a network which is currently really in trouble because the CEO was maybe arrested in China was not any more reachable. Uh, then I don't know, maybe you know, like the beginning of the year, the Moss token was removed from Coinbase. And there are some, I don't want to name too many examples, but you see there's so many information and so many things going around. And for someone who is really seriously thinking about investing into the space, it's impossible to get a really clear idea what am I actually buying. And that's why we make this kind of assessment. Currently in our database, we have over 300 uh, CO2 or ESG related tokens alone, and it's growing constantly. And uh, we really look on the company side. And when we do this, for example, we find out, uh, let's say like 90% of uh, startups, they even don't have free terms in place. So for me, as a buyer and investor, I would not buy something when I don't know the business terms, you know? What happens? Maybe the tokens can be just revoked or quality can be re uh, increased, we have the technology side, we have the compliance side, and that's also really scary. I think we just mentioned it uh, very shortly this evening. Um, who already who really knows how the regulatory side looks like? And when we really speak to those uh, companies, we see there's really a lot of intransparency. They're not really clear, is it really utility token or security token? What are we actually selling? And maybe for an investor, it's really important to find out is that asset at risk because maybe there's a legal issue in the, in the future and then I'm sitting on these tokens and I cannot do anything with that. Also, is the market maybe manipulated? Are there real transactions? Is there real liquidity? As an investor and investing into the space, maybe I want to resell it at some point. <laughs> also for a corporate client, maybe then in two years or three years I get the forward tokens and then I want to uh, make use of them for offsetting and then the token is like empty, it's just like an empty shell. And that's all the things we're checking and then we can really provide uh, the buyer with an in-depth uh, report and really bring up this confidence to invest and to really put money into the space. Um, yeah, that's it. You know, it's a lightning presentation, so I only had like three minutes or something. Therefore, that's the official part. Now, any kind of questions? Everyone shocked? <laughs> no. <laughs> Is open information that anyone can read so, and dive into? Or yeah, so part of the information will be open, uh, maybe like the total rating score, but to get the real in-depth report, subscription is necessary. So this is the business model behind it. You mentioned that one part is actually like if the, the smart contract is certified, but like there is like so many ways to certify a smart contract. Like I'm curious to hear a little bit more about like which standards are you using and who is doing that verification for you? Yeah, so we have external partners, uh, partners who do auditing services and we have some experts also who do like the review. But in the best case, the token issuer who is really responsible to put out, let's say, the product in the market is also responsible to have the let's say, security measurements in place. So therefore, it's definitely a criteria if I release a token to the open market to have it also audited. So, but basically you're talking to them for them to be on your platform, or is this something that like... You mean a token issuer? Yeah, so like, do you look for them to actually come them there and like rank in them, or they go to you to just like, for you to rank them so they... Yeah, get them that's a very good question. So actually we have like kind of a wait list already, because we have a very good network to the banking sector, and we see there is interest to invest into tokenized asset space. 
And therefore, lots of token issuers, they come to us because they want to be visible to this buyer audience. Uh, can you repeat again, how many assets do you have currently in the database? Over 300. And uh, with what, I mean, since when do you um, have the database and at what rate is it, is it growing kind of what's the pace? Uh, that's a good question. I think um, like three months ago there have been maybe 50, so it's growing a lot and only because of webinars and promotion and so on, many come to us because we have or we can establish real buying opportunities currently. Uh, we also talk to like a group of banks who signalize they have interest from their clients but they have no idea what to offer and they're really scared to offer in their name any kind of token so they want to get like this rating and this report to have more like confidence to actually start promoting this kind of product. Um, I mean, why should we trust you? So it's the first question. The second yeah. one, because you know Standard & Poor's, you know all the, all yeah. the scandals in the past. So I yeah. see this is a additional layer of trust in the trustless system. It's very easy because you know once you get like a sample set of data and we can provide it to you if you're interested like to become a customer then you will see all the data we access then you can also see or compare is this the real data so you can do it just for one token we give you like reports of 10 tokens you can go by yourself through one token all the data we have and there you can see it's really the data about this company and then you can see okay there's so much work in it i don't want to do it by myself and then i think you will subscribe Last question, maybe, or what do you think? Mm -hmm. oh, you had already one, so yeah. to be fair, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you, so in the preamble you mentioned, do, do you go and rate, like, for example, NCT and BCT, or do you rate TCO2 tokens at like project level? Um, on the token level and company level and technology level, not so much on the project level, so you know, you have like P0 and Zavara in place, and it's really complex to we really look into the CARM project and as we are not only operating in the CARM space, we are more like on the token, legal, technology, company level. Okay, so like BCT, like BCT and CT, for example, you would like... Put that they will also be rated, but more like, okay, who is issuing it, what's behind that, and you know, what are the terms and so on. Ah, uh, okay. So and then, you know, maybe one question you also have in mind is about how do we rate a pool of tokens? And I have to say, no idea yet. This will come in a few weeks. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so we have two more talks, and I invite Adrian from Second to join here. We have two more talks, then we'll have 15 minute breaks, so stay with us. And uh, Adrian, please. Yeah, thanks, Lucas, for the invite. Um, Alison, for setting it up. I almost missed the event because this morning I met with René and he from Cello, and he told me like, no, no, the event is tomorrow because that's also the event tomorrow. And so I was like, okay, so and I just come tomorrow. That would have sucked. Uh, <laughs> thanks that you sent another email. Um, Glad that you're here. Yeah, I'm, I'm Adrian, the founder and CEO of Zenken. Um, we launched like a year ago almost, um, and we basically, you can compare it like OpenSea for carbon markets, right? OpenSea, the first time ever, like tried to get like a new asset class aggregated into one easy to use interface. And basically we did the same for carbon credits. Um, and I mean, Alison already um, talked a lot about the problems, but I maybe just quickly want to share how our journey actually started because that shows you a lot of the problems that are in the market. So we are now like around almost 30 people and we have one office in Cape Town and one in Berlin and I'm actually located in, in, in Cape Town and I moved there like two and a half years ago and um, I talked to a lot of farmers over there and all these farmers somehow were interacting already with the carbon market through regenerative agriculture or maybe even they had like big forests as well. And um, there was this one case where one of the farmers sold a carbon credit um, for three dollars. And we by accident saw that exactly this credit got offered to Axel Springer for fifteen dollars. So like basically twelve dollars lost without any impact. But then we tried to figure out like, okay, with where did the money go? So they bought it from a, from a carbon accounting tool which is not existent anymore, but a big Berlin company, and they already charged 40% on top. And we asked like, this company, like, where did you get the credit from? And then they said, 
I mean, we got it from a broker. I can give you the contact. We, are, we talked to that broker, and he said, like, yeah, I charge a big fee, but I don't tell you um, how much. And I also don't tell you from where I got it. But I, it's another broker. So what we quickly realized is that every transaction almost is, has, like, four to five intermediaries involved. And like some even taking up to 100 or 200 percent on top of the actual fee that ends up at the project developer. So quickly realized, okay, no transparency, um, a lot of transaction costs, and um, we then said like, okay, that maybe sounds like a blockchain problem. Um, and then the other thing was like we were lucky that, and a couple of names already got mentioned like. Two years ago, a lot of infrastructure has been actually built in the carbon space. Like we heard about ratings, um, for instance, E zero rating carbon projects. Then also Tucan building like the first infrastructure to tokenize carbon credits. But the actual target group of carbon credits are corporates, and they will not use sushi swap. So we then said, like, okay, let's try to bring all this infrastructure together and connect it with the customer layer, which are actually corporates. And the plan is just to aggregate all sorts of, it's not really nice on this screen, but um, to aggregate all sorts of different layers, right? So you have like insane amount of projects, I think more than 170 different um, project standards. Then you have a lot of players like either being um, registries or maybe being their own um, registry themselves um, directly tokenizing. And we br bring it all together into one platform and then you can compare whatever you want. You can compare them for different kind of ratings. You can, for instance, filter like, hey, how many projects have a double A, the two be second best rating? There are only five projects in the world. Um, there's not a single project actually with the best rating on B0, which I find quite interesting. Um, you can also filter for location, you can filter for sustainable development goals, you can filter for all these kind of things. You can um, then also see transaction history. As I mentioned, like everything or most of the stuff is happening over, over the counter. So there's no transaction history, you can't see as a corporate, do I pay the right price? Did someone else sell that credit maybe for three dollars and I now buy it for fifteen dollars? How should they know? There's no really liquid market where they can check like, hey, or oh, buy a regenerative agriculture project from South Africa for $15, what's actually a fair price for that? They don't know. There's nothing out there. So um, just imagine like the experience in the uh, open sea, but a little bit more for on a, on a corporate level. Um, but I thought like maybe I just present the company, but I thought maybe even more interesting is also the learnings because we are live since almost a year. And I think if you work with real-world assets, like, your business is really different than most of the blockchain companies out there. Because, first of all, your clients are, there are some blockchain clients, but most of them are actually corporates. Like, we are, for instance, we're talking a lot with Siemens, and they're one of our clients, but what they're not going and are opening their wallet, right? They're not going with their MetaMask in there and then say, like, oh, maybe use MoonPay, and pay 5% transaction fee on a million dollar transaction. Of course, it's not happening. But we realized quickly that actually there's not a lot of B2B tooling. I mean, there's a lot happening, but most of them promise a lot, and then in the end, it's not working. So that was definitely one of our biggest, biggest learnings, that um, there needs to be a lot of workarounds at the moment to, uh, to sell real-world assets where mostly, or really often, customers um, are just no web-free users. The other thing is wallet management. Like, as I said, um, MetaMask is not the favorite tool of a Siemens or someone like that. So, um, what can we use for that? I mean, there are also some solutions, but all of them not really satisfying. Um, and that has been a massive bottleneck. So, just urge everyone, please, B2B tooling. We definitely need that. Um, so, yeah, where are we, like, after a year? Um, I think um, the space had, like, in general, like, a massive momentum in the beginning. Then, with a lot of things coming up, um, it definitely slowed down a lot. Um, um, but this opened up uh, a lot of opportunities because a lot of these players, that old incumbents, they have been a lot of pressure, under a lot of pressure, and they now have to be more transparent. And I think most of them see, and that was for me a big, big realization, 
um, when we started, like everyone was like, blockchain, no, we don't need that, that's crypto, scary, blah, blah, blah. And now everyone is, yeah, we need it, but we need to implement it properly. And for us, this is a massive, massive sign, even like really all players um, um, coming to that conclusion. And that's why it's super excited to work with Climate Collective or other players in here. So thanks and yeah, open for any questions. <laughs>